when I was a youth pastor uh, uh, in San Diego, uh, between my third and fourth year at Dallas Seminary, you had to do an internship. So I went to my hometown in San Diego and did an internship at my parents' church in uh, Rancho Bernardo, uh, California. What a hard place to suffer for God. It was so nice there. Um, I had a great time. The church, the, the, the youth group grew and flourished. We had a great, great, in fact, I enjoyed being a youth pastor so much. Uh, I actually contemplated not going back to Dallas and finishing my fourth year. That's how much, that's how much fun I had. Uh, but I learned a lot about uh, shepherding uh, young people uh, that year. Uh, there was a, a lady, a young lady in my group. We'll just call her Tracy uh, this morning. Um, she was uh, one of the leaders, uh, one of the youth leaders, uh, full of talent, uh, very vibrant. Uh, she was smart. She was funny. She was perceptive. She was loyal. Uh, she was like one of the young ladies I could, I could count on to help lead the group. Um, had lots of potential uh, in her lifetime. But somewhere along the line, somebody at school, at a party, uh, introduced her to cocaine. Uh, and she, because of peer pressure, took some. Uh, and it wasn't long thereafter uh, that, that uh, one uh, episode became daily episodes. And eventually took over her entire life and controlled her. Uh, sad, sad thing to watch. She ended up doing things that she told me I never dreamed I would do. Uh, one case in point is she... Uh, went into her mother's bedroom where her mother's uh, uh, mother, her grandma, had given her mother her wedding rings. Uh, and they were sitting on the dresser, and she took those wedding rings and sold them so she could buy cocaine. Imagine the tragedy of that. So consumed by that. I remember the last time I saw her, I was uh, going back to Dallas Seminary to finish my fourth year, uh, and I got a phone call uh, from a detox center uh, in La Jolla, over on the coast, uh, and it was her. And she said, I know you're going back to seminary. Uh, could you come see me? Could you come pray for me? And I said, absolutely. So I got in the car, uh, and I drove over to La Jolla, and I went to the detox uh, center where she was. I, I don't think I was prepared for what she looked like. And my dad was a federal officer. I, you know, I, I'd been around drugs all my life, uh, either friends that did them or my dad arrested people that did them. Um, but I really wasn't, I, hadn't, I was shocked when I walked in the door. Uh, went down to her room. This beautiful young woman was a skeleton sitting on the end of her bed. There wasn't much left of her. Uh, the drugs had completely taken a toll on her. Uh, and as I went in there to talk with her and her mother, uh, she just wanted to know one thing for me. She said, would you, would you pray for me? I really need prayer. Boy, did she. And so what do you think I prayed for her that day, this Tracy? I prayed for, uh, for God, uh, take this young child of his, uh, and to help her get off the cycle of sin, to break free, because she had given in to the, de to the devil's raspy voice, and she needed to get freedom, and she had willfully chosen to do that. Now she needed to willfully choose to allow the Spirit's power in her uh, to give her victory, and she just needed to appeal to him. So we prayed that day for God, God to give her victory. Um, I don't know, since then, that was many, many years ago. That was, wow. 1985, I think, 1984, a long time ago. Uh, I don't know what's happened to her since. I trust her to God's care. Uh, but in those kinds of situations, you're called to do what you're called to do, correct? Step in, pray, call, challenge them to, to lead a victorious life. Uh, Paul uh, talked about this uh, when he wrote to the Roman church. Uh, and in, in uh, chapter 6, he writes these words. He says, Therefore, do not let sin as a Christian reign in your mortal body that you should obey its lusts. It's a desire, sin is. He says, do not go on presenting the members of your body uh, to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. But on the flip side, he says, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness of God. Whenever you take a, a negative, like a word, the word no in the Greek text, and you wed it to a present tense imperative, it forbids an action uh, that is in, in, in progress. Don't even begin to think about doing this. Don't, don't even go down this road. Uh, and that's what I was telling that young lady, Tracy, don't, you know, you need to stop letting sin have domination over your life. Because as a Christian, you have the ability with the Spirit's power to reject the sinful activity and embrace godly activity. You need to do that today. And maybe that's you. Maybe you're Tracy. Uh, that m Maybe it's not cocaine for you. Maybe it's some other kind of uh, drug, as it were, something that you just crave and you just have to have. And it just, that sin just controls you. Uh, you, you need to realize that you don't have to present yourself, as Paul says, as a, as, as a, as a, a member of unrighteousness because God's freed you. He empowers you uh, to live hopefully. Uh, and if you read Romans chapter 7, it's a great chapter where Paul struggles with this sin. Basically, read it. 
The things that I wish I would like to do, I don't do them. I do the things that I don't want to do, et cetera. It's just that struggle between the, uh, the flesh and, and your spirit wanting to do great things for God. So if you've got onto the cycle of sin and you don't, like Tracy did, and you kind of feel hopeless, full of despair, uh, uh, God is always there to give you hope, and that's Psalm 106. Uh, you read these 48 verses, uh, and one main motif will emerge from them all. And the main motif, specifically from this text, uh, is it's the Holy Spirit uh, is crying out to you, and he's telling you one thing. It's time to stop the crazy cycle of sin, of carnal sin, as a Christian, speaking specifically. Uh, now, if you're not a Christian, uh, you are under the domination of sin, according to Romans 5, 12 to 21. Uh, sin is your master, and you do what uh, sin calls you to do, and you might not even think it's all that bad, but it, it owns you. But once you trust Christ as Savior, you're free from that domination of sin, and now have the ability for the first time in your life to appeal to God's Spirit to help you walk in a righteous way. But if you're caught in that cycle, Psalm 106 is the song for you as a Christian. It's written primarily to Christians. I want to say a couple foundational things before we look at these 48 verses. Uh, number one, because there are 48 verses, there's no way in the world we could co cover them in the next 30 minutes, correct? Because I typically go really slow, analyze every word, every clause, etc. So uh, we're not going to do that. So we're going to spend two Sundays looking at these 48 verses, which also says I'm not going to be able to look at every single thing here just because of the preponderance of uh, data here. So we're going to cover the, the basic main things, all right? Number two, um, if you're not a Christian, as I said, uh, you are under the domination of sin. So today would be the day that you would say for the first time in your life, I need Christ because I can't break free from this sin on my own. Tracy had the ability to break free because she knew Christ and she needed the Spirit's power to help her break free. So uh, today's the day I would challenge you to come to know Christ. But with these th things in mind, uh, I wanna tell you in these, th these 48 verses, there's uh, three structural markers. Uh, and in these three structural markers, you find uh, the three motifs of how to stop the crazy cycle of sin. And we're gonna look at uh, two of them today. Uh, the first concept is developed in verses 1 to 5. And this is where the author says, realize, if you're on the crazy cycle of sin, that, that there's, a, there's a right path. There's a right path uh, that you can be on. Um, we want to look at what he says about the right path that you can be on. Verse 1. He says that he, he must have been a very positive person because he starts out with praise the Lord. So for him, the glass is half full. He's a positive person. Uh, so he's going to get into the sin in just a minute. In fact, that's going to consume the major part of the passage. But he's going to say, before we look at uh, the sinful cycle, he says, I want to first tell you that you realize, realize that in life there's always the right path that you can take as a Christian. So he says, praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Why? Well, for he's good. For his loving kindness is everlasting. Who can speak of the mighty deeds of the Lord or who can show forth his praise? Uh, so this is uh, the first of what we would call hallelujah psalms. Uh, hallelujah, um, combination of a couple of Hebrew words that they staple together, much like they do if you've got German, where German builds these really long words where they just staple a bunch of words together. And when you're sitting in a German class, you have to ask the professor, how do I even begin to say that word? Uh, Hebrew does this. And so, hallelujah, as it's halal means to praise God. Uh, and uh, the, the yah part is, is God. So you're praising God. You're lifting him up. And it means to lift up higher than yourself. So the, the praise psalms, and we won't cover all of them, uh, would be uh, this psalm. Uh, psalms 111 through 113. Uh, Psalm 117, Psalm 135, and then 146 to 150. In fact, the Psalter ends on a praise psalm. Isn't that great? As all these psalms ends on this crescendo. And so this is a praise psalm, but it's a get real praise psalm because he's going to talk about praising God for he's the one who's with you even when you sin. So did, did God abandon Tracy when she willfully chose the road of cocaine? No, no, he didn't. No, because in Romans 8, Paul's going to talk about nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. Not height, not depth, not principalities, not powers, not things to come, etc. So he's, he's going to tell you nothing can separate you from the love of Christ, but you can tarnish the love, but he will not leave you. So what he does here in the Psalter, he's ta talking like Paul does in, in Romans 8. And he, he says God is good, and he says he's good because his loving kindness is everlasting. It's not temporary. And he uses the word chesed here. Chesed speaks of uh, that kind of love which is unshakable, unbreakable. I mean, you, you, you can't get away from it. It just it has a hold of you. And I would say that if anybody has a grip, it's God, correct? 
And even the Lord Jesus said, uh, nobody can take you out of my hand, right? This is why I believe in eternal security, because once you're saved, who's got you? He does. Uh, it doesn't mean you're always going to live like a child of God, like Tracy, but he still has you. And that's what loving kindness, chesed, means. Uh, in verse 3, he's going to zero in on why you should praise God uh, as a Christian on the path of life, on the right path of life. He says, how blessed are those who keep justice, who practice righteousness, and do it just some of the times. That's kind of like how DC rolls, isn't it? Uh, they just do justice and righteousness every once in a while. Now he says, if you want to live a blessed life, here's how you do it. You got to do two things. What do you got to do? Keep justice and practice righteousness and do it as a lifestyle. And then he has this request of God. Remember me, O Lord, in thy favor toward thy people. And he says, visit me with, I, I want one thing. He's already a Christian, but now he says, Lord, uh, you're the God of Hesed. You, you, you're the God that's loyal in your love toward me. And I have veered off the course and, and I need you to bring me some Yasha, Yasham, you, Yashua. I need some salvation. I need you to deliver me. So this is the great name of Jesus in the New Testament. I need salvation. So he's telling you, I, I praise God, but I, I've got some issues in my life, some cycles of sin. I, God, I need some help. Uh, and by the way, this uh, Psalm was written during the period of the Babylonian captivity. That's super important to understand because context is everything, correct? And so when you think about Psalm 106 in the Babylonian captivity, if anybody should have learned what you should not do as a follower of God, it should have been those people, right? They should have been able to look back at their forefathers and said, we are not going to repeat the sins of our grandpa, our great-grandpa. I mean, they blew it. We are not going to, but they did, didn't they? And they wound up in Babylonian captivity. So that's the context, all right? But he says, if you want to uh, live a really blessed life, you just need to do two things. You need to keep justice and practice righteousness. That's the right path of life. What's the devil tell you? What's the devil tell a Tracy type? Well, he comes to you with that little raspy voice, and he tells you, don't go that way. Don't follow God. I mean, how prudish. Don't live that way. Follow my way. Because he will tell you, as he comes and talks to you, that his way is the sweeter way, but his way is usually the bitter way, correct? I mean, sin, I mean, stolen bread is sweet for a moment, and then, well, then guilt sets in. Uh, one time when I was a, a child, I was probably seven, eight years old, uh, my mom gave clear instructions in the kitchen as she was leaving, you know, you guys don't have any snacks, don't look for snacks, I'm going out for a few, you know, a little bit to the store, and, you know, stay out of the kitchen. What did I hear? She told me to go in the kitchen. And she could tell, I think my mother's in this service. She will attest that this is, this is exactly what happened. So she left. Uh, and so I just moseyed on into the kitchen looking for one thing, snacks. Uh, as I was moseying on around, I couldn't find anything. I was totally desperate. It was like, I was like an addict looking for the snacks. And I climbed up on the counter uh, and began to go through the cabinets that were, you know, too, too high for me to reach because I was just a, you know, a little kid. Uh, and I got up there uh, with a chair and began to open cabinets. And I found a box of chocolates. And I thought, it is my lucky day. God is good. <laughs> now, remember, at this time, I wasn't a Christian, of course, but I had my issues. So I got the box of chocolate out. I opened it. I looked at how many were in there, and I'm thinking, I could take one or two of these. Certainly, she doesn't have them counted, you know, so I could take one or two. She won't, she won't miss them. And so I opened the box, you know, pulled one out, and then sunk, sunk my teeth into that big chocolate cube of baking chocolate. <laughs> 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 yeah. On a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being uber bitter, it's a 15. <laughs> and I know it's like my, there, there weren't cameras in kitchens back then, remember? They just barely had electricity back in the 60s, you know? And I'm thinking, you know, if my mother was watching me then, she's probably laughing all the way to the bank. Like, I told you not to go. You know, so, I mean, think about that. It's, it's like, that's like the devil, right? He's telling you, oh, this is going to be sweet. This one little thing of cocaine is going to be sweet. Oh, no, it's not. No, it's not. It's going to be bitter, and it's going to destroy you. Uh, I never went searching through my mother's kitchen again uh, be because of that episode. Uh, it has great spiritual import in my life today. So with verse 3, he tells us, if you want to live on the right path and live a blessed life, it's really simple. Like if you're feeling depressed and discouraged today, he's, it's real simple what you need to do on the right path. Two things you must do as a lifestyle. We already mentioned them. What are they? Live a just life. 
and live a righteous life. Richer life. Well, so what exactly does that mean? Well, that means that I, don't, I live a life according to how God says I should live it. So I should be reading the word and asking, is my life matching up to the principles contained therein? And so a just life. Well, a just person follows the law. They don't bend the law, correct? Uh, a just person treats all people the same, regardless of the race how much they're worth, what their educational value is accepted. That's a just person. Uh, a just person uh, stands for truth, right? Uh, not for those things masquerading its truth. So uh, there's lots of things to justice, but a just person lives in a way that's uh, measured against God's justice. And then he says, uh, also live a lifestyle on the right path by pursuing righteous persons, uh, or righteous principles. So when you think about righteousness, uh, righteousness is the kind of person who steers clear of sin. Like when they offer you the drug, as they did me when I was growing up, many times, uh, I told them, I'm not going down that road. Uh, you know, no way. Uh, you, 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 you see what that is and you righteously don't pursue that. So a right, righteous person sees the sinful things and then goes against them. A righteous person isn't bothered by people who are bothered by sin. You got to think about this. Because our culture is ever more getting to where they're bothered by people who are bothered by sin. Used to, we found sin abhorrent. Now it's like that you're bothered by people who stand for moral things. So ask God to show you what uh, righteous behavior, just behavior is. In any given situation, he will show you. Because if you want to live a blessed life, that's how you should live. Is it possible to live a just, righteous life all of the time? Or do you pessimist? No, it's not possible. Why? You, you can't get out of the building, right? Something's going to happen, as I've told you before. I mean, you can't get through the day. Something's going to happen. And so, uh, but, but it's not, it, it is possible to live more just today than I was yesterday. It is possible to build each day on being more just, more righteous. That's spiritual maturity. Uh, John chapter 13, we read these words. Uh, Jesus says, for I gave you an example that you should, you should also do as I did to you. So follow my, follow my lead. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, a slave, that's you as a Christian, is not greater than his master, Jesus. Neither is one who is sent greater than one who sent him. Now, notice the conditional clause. If you know these things that you're supposed to model me, you are what? Blessed if you do them. It's conditional, isn't it? So there's a protesis and an apotesis. The protesis is the if, the apotesis is the then. It's all conditional. I, as a Christian, like Tracy, can say, I'm trying cocaine today just to see if I like it. Ah, uh, no, no. But Jesus says, if you want to live a, live a blessed life, then just follow my example. So who should you really be studying? Uh, as jo Josh pointed out so eloquently, and by the way, did he not do a fantastic job last week? Yes. Yeah, he, Hebrews exegesis chapter 12 was amazing. Um, but um, if you want to live that blessed life, then just follow Jesus. Study him well. That's what Josh was talking about last week. Uh, James chapter one, I love this uh, passage, but prove yourselves doers of the word, not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks in his natural face in a mirror. For once he's looked for at himself and gone away, he immediately has forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who looks in, intently into the perfect law, the law of liberty, uh, God's word, and then abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual, effectual doer, this man is blessed in what he does. Did you spend some time in front of the mirror this morning? Did you? Men, checking things out, goatees trimmed, tight, everything's good. You see, I, ca I came to church this morning. I was, uh, I'm, we're remodeling our kitchen and, and stuff, so I've been doing baseboards. And somebody came up to me today and he said, what's all over your glasses? I'm like, I, I, what do you mean? I mean, I, and I, you know, shaved and everything this morning. And, and I look at my glasses, I pull them off out here, out here in the foyer. Uh, thank God for Christians who confront you. And I, I got white paint, like all over, and, and I've got drywall and everything. It's like embarrassing. Uh, you know, I forgot that, that I wasn't even looking. If you're a doer of the word, this is a blessed person. The person who walks out of here on Sunday morning is like, I don't have an idea what Marty was talking about. I'm not doing any of that anyway. You're not blessed. But, but you are blessed when you say, man, I got to do something about that. I got to get on the right path. Right path is a blessed life. It's one thing to hear the word, quite another to do it, right? There's a lot of Christians who think spirituality is how much they know. No, it's not, it's not how much you know, it's how much do you obey what you know. So if you're tempted to be on a, on a cycle of sin um, and you've got on that cycle of sin like Tracy did, realize there's a right path and you can choose the right path.
Uh, when I was in uh, high school, I was in San Diego uh, where we would go because uh, I lived near San Diego and we would drive and rent a house on the beach uh, in the summers with my parents occasionally and uh, we would take different friends and uh, so I did a lot of boogie boarding uh, out in the ocean. Uh, Pacific's very cold, isn't it? It's, it's, it's painful. But you get out there, kind of get numb to you. Well, in fact, you're just, you're moving there in what? A couple weeks, right? We'll pray for you. It's cold. Uh, but I was boogie boarding with my uh, pastor's son, uh, Tim, and we went out uh, hitting some uh, six to eight foot waves, having a great old time. Uh, and we would kind of pace ourselves where we were on the beach by where the, the uh, lifeguard towers were. And we got in a riptide. You ever been in a riptide? Yeah, I thought we were going to wind up in Japan. Uh, we, we got sucked out into the ocean, I mean, beyond the waves to where the boats are going by us. And we're bobbing out there. We're like, man, we, 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 as strong as we were, we can't swim back in. So what do you do when you're kind of in a riptide? We, you swim parallel. And so we swam parallel, I mean, for a long ways, and then we were able to get out of it, and then we were able to get back to the beach, and I'm here today because two high school kids with a brain. But what did we do? We willfully had to say, I'm not staying in this bad riptide anymore. It leads to death. I'm getting out of it. We swam away from it. And that's what I would tell you if you're a Christian uh, and you're not on the right path, uh, you can get on the right path. Willfully choose to obey the word. Number two, realize that there is a wrong path. That's verses uh, 6 through 46. So by way of law of proportion, uh, when you take a class on hermeneutics, Bible study methods, they will tell you, uh, look at the law of proportion. Uh, that whatever uh, is the uh, vast amount of evidence in a given passage, it's where the focus is. And this is rightly so because the author is saying, I'm in Babylonian captivity. I cannot believe I, along with my people, have committed the same sins my forefathers did. Remember, you look at your dad and you think, I do not want to do the things my dad did. And then you wake up one day and what do you say to yourself? Wow, I'm like my dad. So he's looking back and he's saying, God, I need salvation. So in verse four, he says, visit me with salvation because he realizes I, I need help. He's on the wrong path. He says in verse six, we, notice it's plural, we have sinned like our fathers. We have committed iniquity. We have behaved wickedly. So he just used three different words in Hebrew for sin because sin has different, different commodities about it. Um, he says, yeah, 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 we sinned just like our parents and our grandparents did. So he's, he's, he's dismayed, he's dumbfounded. He cannot believe I've got onto this, this crazy cycle of sin when it's written in biblical notation, don't do this. I mean, I heard the stories from my dad, my grandpa of things they did as young men. And if you're a young person sitting here today and your parents sit you down and, and have that conversation, like, you know, like when I was your age, remember that? When I was your age, you know, and I faced something like that. They're giving you wisdom. Listen to that. And so he says, I cannot believe I did not listen. I'm going to show you a picture of a whirlpool. And I have a question for you. Who in their right mind would take their kayak <laughs> and think to themselves with a friend with them? Or maybe your wife's with you. Hey, baby, we could totally do this. We're going to get as close to that whirlpool for a good view as possible. Who would do that? Now, I know there's special ops people here like, if we, we do it every day. I mean, I would dive into the middle of it. But just, you know, be real. Most humans are not going to get near that. Because if you get near that, what's going to happen? You get sucked in. What happened to Tracy? Well, I'll just, you know, I'm at a party, peer pressure. I want to be cool. Uh, and I'll, just one time. One time becomes a zillion times. I had a man in my first church. Uh, Cyrus Vance was his name. Uh, uh, he said that uh, all through World War II, as, a, uh, as an army infantryman fighting in France, all the things that he did, he said, I never drop, just touched a drop of liquor, not once. He said, when we finally won the war, he said, I was over in Europe, and everybody was celebrating by drinking. He said, I drank one time to celebrate. And then I said, he said, I then drank myself almost to death until Christ saved me. Just took one time. He said, it just took one time. So that's what the psalmist is saying. I, can't, I cannot believe I, well, I paddled so close to that whirlpool. So in verse 7 through verse 46, the psalmist is going to take you, uh, in verses 7 to 46, through two times, two time periods and two geographical uh, areas where Israel stepped onto the sin cycle willingly. 
Uh, and there's no way we're going to cover all that. So we're, we're going to look at this uh, cycle of sin uh, by looking at verses 7 through 33, namely just 7 to 15. Uh, but before we look at the cycle of sin, I want to show you a, a picture that I put together, a graphic of the cycle of sin, just to describe it to you in case you might be on this particular cycle. And so I think you need to look at this. So how do, and there's going to be some exceptions to the cycle of sin as we work through uh, uh, chapter uh, uh, 106 verses uh, 7 and following. But it typically works like this with some exceptions. God does something great in your life, divine provision, like he saves you. And you know that he did. And then, uh, uh, then there's like this momentary belief uh, in what God has done because you're so amazed at what he did, you're like, whoa, he's God. And then the devil comes with his little raspy voice and says, hey, have you considered this over here? And then you rebel and turn against God. And then you turn against God for a while, for a week, for a month, for a year, for 10 years, disobedient. And then what's God do? Because he loves you, Hebrews 12. Oh, well, because he loves you, he disciplines you to get your attention, divine discipline. And then as he disciplines you because he loves you, then he turns to you and says, you know, I, for, I forgive you when you repent. I forgive you. That's the hesed. And then it goes back to that cycle again that, well, God has done something amazing. He's forgiven me. I'll never forget what he forgave me for. And next thing you know, you're back into quick rebellion. It kind of goes like that. And you stop and look at yourself and like, what am I doing? And so when you look at this passage, uh, we'll call it a photo album of, of cyclical sin. We're going to look at a, what is called uh, the wandering period. Israel in the wilderness is verses 7 to 33. Uh, and we're just going to cover one snapshot because uh, there's six snapshots of the wandering period of the wilderness of Israel uh, that shows how they did not fare with God. Uh, we're going to look at shot, snapshot number one, uh, what I would call uh, the Exodus, verses 7 to 15. He says in verse 7, Our fathers in Egypt did not understand thy wonders. They did not remember thine abundant kindness. But notice what they did. <laughs> but they rebelled willfully by the sea, at the Red Sea. You have got to be kidding me. What did he just say? They did not understand thy wonders. Uh, Dr. Alan Ross, who taught me Hebrew at Dallas Seminary, translates this particular uh, uh, clause here uh, that they became indifferent that they gave no thought to the ten plagues that God had just shown them are you thinking mind you would think if you're a slave for hundreds of years and an old man shows up with a staff <laughs> and he brings Egypt to its knees with ten miraculous plagues like um, turning the Nile to blood uh, multiplying frogs like cicada uh, aren't those things? They're everywhere. Um, gnats and mosquitoes. Unbelievable. Um, the flies that God sent, the plague of the cattle, uh, the boils, the hellfire, the locusts, the darkness, the death of the firstborn. All these things happen when this old man prayed. You would think if you're a Jew, you'd be thinking, and we're talking darkness in their camp. Not darkness in the Israelite camp. You would think, God is awesome. I will always obey him. I will never be disobedient. And what does the psalmist say? Our fathers did not understand. Huh? You have got to be kidding me. No, they didn't want to understand. They became indifferent. See, this is uh, your first step onto the wrong path, is God does great things in your life, and you momentarily believe him, and then all of a sudden you get to that point where you're alive where you forget him, and you become completely indifferent to the things of God. Jeremiah uh, said in chapter 17, verse 9, the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately, what? Wicked. Wicked. And then he adds this point, who can know it? Indeed, shocking, isn't it? And so with their backs up against the Red Sea, uh, how did the, the uh, Israelites uh, fare? Because they've already seen the 10 plagues of God's great actions to free them. Now they're backed up against the, the, the Red Sea. It's on the east of them. The chariots are closing in on them. How, how did they fare? Verse 10 tells you. And as Pharaoh, uh, Exodus 14, uh, drew near, the sons of Israel looked and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them and they became emboldened in their faith. Uh, they folded like a lawn chair. They became very frightened. So the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, Notice what they, notice what they say. Uh, is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you've taken away for us out here to die in the wilderness? Uh, why have you dealt with us this way, bringing us out of Egypt? Uh, is this not the word that we spoke to you when? In Egypt? You, you, you're in your 80s and you want to take us out into the wilderness? Is there any water out there? No. Is there any cloud cover? No. Is there anything to eat? Well, not really. 
and you're going to take two million of us out into the wilderness? What are you thinking? That's what they're saying. Is this not the word that we said in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians, for it would be better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. How great is their faith? They just saw 10 plagues, and they have become indifferent to God Almighty. God might have shown you 10 amazing things in your life, and you're back to the cycle of sin. Why? Because, well, you've grown indifferent to the things of God. That's where they were. They wanted to go back to their slavery. The scripture is clear. 2 Peter 2, verse 22. It has happened to them according to the true proverb. A dog returns to its own what? Vomit. I mean, I have a dog. It's gross, isn't it? Yeah, that's what they did. That's, that's what Tracy did, isn't it? Free, free, and she decides at one party to go back to that which she should not go back. Maybe you've done that. How did God respond? Notice the cycle of sin. Verse 8, Psalm 106. Nevertheless... He saved them. Why did he save them? For the sake of his name. Because they're dragging his name through the mud. You know, Jesus might come in and just save you just because your sin's dragging his name through the mud. He saved them for his great name uh, that he might make his power known. He rebuked the Red Sea, he dried it up, he led them through the deeps, through the wilderness. He saved them from the hand of the one who hated them. He redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. Boy, did he. And the waters covered their adversaries, not one of them was left. You would think that when you got to the other side of the Red Sea and old man Moses went out with his staff and commanded the waters to be closed with all the chariots in the seabed, you would think you would say to your children with you and everybody in your family, we will never question God again but they did. The, the average depth of the Red Sea is 1,608 feet. Imagine when it was parted. As you walked through there with the seabed instantly dried up and you walked through there, all 2 million of you, with 1,600 feet of walls of water next to you with fish swimming in there, water churning, and the hand of God holding it back, you would think, I will, I will never question God again. Well, they did. It says in verse 12, uh, they, they believed his words and they sang his praise. What is sad about that? What's sad about that is they didn't believe his words first. See, it took a work for them to believe. This tells you they had shallow faith. See, what's better is for you, when God says something, you believe the word first and don't have to wait for God to do something. Verse uh, 13, it tells you how they fared after that. It says they quickly forgot his works. They did not wait for his counsel. Shocking. But they craved intensely in the wilderness and they tempted God in the desert. What did he do? Notice the cycle of sin. Oh, he gave them their request, all right. He sent to them a wasting disease among them. This is a cycle of sin. See, no sooner did Moses and his, and his wife Miriam, uh, who was a prophetess, finish singing their songs in Exodus chapter 15 to God for his deliverance at the Red Sea. No sooner did they finish those songs and they got to the other side then in chapter 16 of Exodus, they asked for two things. In fact, it says in the Hebrew text, uh, it says they quickly forgot his works. They didn't wait for his counsel, but they craved intensely. The, the Hebrew text means they craved a craving, consumed. And you might think, well, I, I, I would never do that. Just buy Girl Scout cookies. <laughs> and what happens to you? The box is talking to me, isn't it? You know, you, Thin Mints, let's just take them as a case in point. Or macaroons, you know what I'm talking about? You got two rows in there, right? They are specifically designed to fit into the palate of your mouth. You don't need two bites, you just need just one. And so you put them in the freezer, Primo in the freezer, and you open the box up and you tell yourself, I'm in total control, I'm just gonna eat one. Right, what happens? The row's gone. And you're thinking, well, I cleaned out one row, what could two rows hurt? And there's five boxes the kids are never gonna know. Yeah, right. See, we would call that craving a craving, correct? This is what Israel did. They craved a craving. They, 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 they're out in the desert, clouds following them, pillar of fire by night, and, but they craved a craving. What did they want? They wanted uh, water and they wanted food. Now, that's not inherently bad, is it? So is it inherently bad to want one thin mint? You're thinking about it. Not, not really, but to have 30? Well, that, that's worth confronting over. And so this is, this is, you know, they're, they're testing God. Where are we going to get our food? I don't, I don't know. Uh, where are we going to get water? 
I haven't any idea. I don't, you see any water? I don't see any water. I've been out in the Sinai. You don't see water. What do you see? Sand to infinity, an occasional acacia tree here and there. And so when you go to Israel and go to the Sinai, you can understand like how they kind of imploded, but they, they had seen God's hand and they still imploded. They, they craved a craving. I was talking to a Christian mother uh, in another state a couple of weeks ago uh, who's having an affair on her husband. And I confronted her. That's, that's what we do, right? Because I love her. And she needs to move away from her sin. And so I had, a, I had a little chat with her. And I asked her, the man you're having an affair with, uh, how many times has he been married? Three. How many times have you been married? Two. And you think this is God's gift for you? This is not God's gift for you. This is the box of chocolates. It looks sweet. It's going to be very bitter. The best thing you can do is go back to your husband and embrace him and love him and, and work through your problems. That's what you need to do. Um, I've not heard back from her. I wonder why. Because when you crave a craving, it consumes you. And you get to the point where you don't want to hear godly counsel anymore. You hear godless counsel. In fact, you'll put people all around you who will give you input that validates your sin. But he says, this was Israel. They were consumed with a craving in the desert. And so God gave them over to their request. So what did he do? Well, he gave them manna for 40 years. And I've told you before, I'll tell you again in case you don't know. Manna, mana in Hebrew means, what's that? And don't you know, this is exactly what you would say. If you walked out into the morning of the camp and on the sand is this bread-like substance. Don't you know a child would stand there and go, mom, mana, what's, what's that? Oh, eat that. It's like Roman meal. I mean, just enjoy it. It's from God. And, and then he gave them meat to eat. And if you read uh, Exodus, what he did is he, in Numbers chapter 11, he sent quail their way. Just blew a whole bunch of birds their way. So much meat, they gorged themselves. Remember, they craved a craving because they questioned God. And it says, while the meat was still in their mouths, God struck them with a plague. Remember the cycle of sin? He loves them. He disciplines them. I don't know where you're at today if you're craving a craving because that one uh, snort of cocaine became a lifestyle. Is that one sin becomes a lifestyle. That one affair can become five affairs. That one thing becomes many things, a crave to craving. It's, it's the wrong path. How do you get on the right path? Well, as a Christian, it's, it's called confession. One of the first verses I had to learn as a new Christian in 1967 was 1 John 1, 9. If you confess your sins, he's what? Faithful and just to forgive you of all, what? All your sins. Cleanse you from all your unrighteousness. And once you're cleansed, then you're back on the right path. If you're a Christian today, today's the day to say, God, wow, I got, I got to do something today. And if you're not a Christian today, well, then today's the day to say, God, boy, I'm, I've always been on the wrong path. Forgive me of my sin today. Be my savior and he shall save you because he's full of loving kindness. Let me pray for you. God, thank you for the word today. Teach us to follow hard after you. Those who don't know you, pray this would be the day that be their spiritual birthday when they come to know you. We praise you for loving us even when we walk away. And uh, thank you for being the good shepherd who woos us back in Christ's name, amen. God bless you. Have a great day.